Would I be ready to host a refugee? Would you? My wife and I asked ourselves this question about nine months ago, after seeing all the news about the sinking boats full of refugees. And of course, the picture of the dead boy stranded on the beach in Turkey. It didn't feel right. It was happening right here on the doorsteps of Europe. There must be something we can do to help. We are neither experts of immigration nor anthropologists. We are an ordinary family. We have uh, three children, we live in a house in Riga. I run a small business, uh, I run a board game company. But how would it be like to host a refugee? What would it feel like to have a stranger in your house? How would my children react? What would parents say, neighbors, colleagues, friends? So many questions and unknowns. And where do you turn if you're looking for advice or look for like-minded people? Thank Mark, we have Facebook now. And I typed those two sentences on my timeline. Our family would be ready to host a refugee. Has anyone else been thinking about this? And just before hitting the post button, I knew that this is not a simple post. It's something much more that could create a lot of discussions and maybe start an avalanche. As a result of those discussions on a post, the same evening we created a Facebook group called Grib Poli Begdem, in English, uh, I want to help refugees. The aim of the group was not to have discussions on whether to help, but rather to have discussions on how to help the refugees. Next morning, I received a phone call from my mom. Uh-oh. Son, I hope you're not serious about your yesterday's Facebook post, she said. Um, I said, uh, yes, I am. We really are. And she says, come on, you have uh, three children and uh, enough difficulties managing your own family. Why would you need more problems? And as a parent, I totally understand her. She cares about me, she cares about my family. Okay, so where do we start helping? I contacted the local refugee center, which is near Riga. And we went there to organize a board game evening. We put out posters in the center to invite all the refugees residing there. And as we came to the room on the designated time, it was empty. Nobody was there. Okay, we said, well, let's have some fun and play some board games. And uh, we did. The refugees passing by the room, they were attracted, and one by one, they were joining us. It was a small event, but uh, it was a successful one. It was our first encounter with refugees, and we gained their first trust. And it was great to see them smile. We assessed their first needs, and as the winter was coming, and most of the refugees have arrived just in flip-flops, clothes and food were the two major things they needed. We asked our group members to bring those things to my board game store, which I used as a collection point. And the response was amazing. When we asked for rice, all the stores around my shop were actually sold out of rice. There was a time when I was going to refugee center once a week with a full car of clothes and food. We also organized events in Riga. We invited all the refugees from the center. We made together workshops. They came with their families. We came with ours. We prepared food together with the help of local chefs. We had the workshop of uh, ginger baking. It was great. We all had a feeling of uh, togetherness. At one of these events, I noticed a group from Congo. I remember them because uh, they were somehow more separated from the other crowd. Most probably because of the language. They all spoke only French. My wife speaks French, and uh, she had a little chat with one of them. Her name was Nancy, and she was breastfeeding her little daughter in the yard. All the Congo people who have asked for a refugee status in Latvia got rejections. 
In fact, Latvia has the lowest percentage of accepting refugees in the European Union. It's 8%, compared to 77% in Sweden, for example. 8%. Idiots and traitors, this is how we were called in the comments under the news articles about our activities in the biggest uh, news portals. At some point, I understood that I don't want my children to be raised in such an environment because the negativity in the media was massive. We have to find a way to influence the environment. And I believe that it's not the system that builds the environment, it's the people that build, build it. And this small Facebook group gave us hope gave me and the other active group members hope, hope that we can actually build an environment where people are not divided by religion, by color of the skin, or what is the biggest challenge here in Latvia, by ethnic background. About a month ago, I received a call from an unknown number during a meeting at work. Please help me. Police come to take me. A woman in a French-speaking accent told. Can you help me, please? Our telephone conversation got disconnected. I tried to call back the number. It was switched off. A few hours later, my wife called the number back. It was Nancy. She explained that uh, she was already being escorted to detention center, which is more than two kilo 200 kilometers away. It was the start of her, of her deportation process. Her husband was a wanted man back in Congo, for he was an active member of the local human rights office. He fled with the other children of theirs, and Nancy didn't know if they're still alive. According to a report from Catherine Ramos called Unsafe Re Return, most of the people who return to Congo after asking refugee status abroad are being treated as enemies of the state. They're being imprisoned, tortured, and that includes children. So I contacted her lawyer, I contacted the, human, the local human rights office, and we agreed that we would appeal the detention and the fact of deportation. And if necessary, we would submit this case to the European Court of Human Rights. In Latvia, the institutions and courts need hard proof evidence. So if you don't have a document which clearly states that you are being persecuted, you probably don't have any chance and you better have an official stamp on it. It turned out that the detention, her detention was based on the fact that she had no place to stay. So if we would be able to find for her a place to stay, somebody who could host her, she would be able to leave the detention center. And there it was. After seven months, my commitment was about to get real. I procrastinated a few days, I thought to myself, I would be able to do more for refugees by organizing things and not actually hosting a refugee myself. I wasn't ready to post about this to Facebook group or to tell it to even most active members of our group or to my friends. Why? Because I was afraid. I was afraid to say it aloud and I was afraid to ask others for help on something that I have committed myself. It was the last possible day to submit the appeal. I signed the statement taking care of Nancy and her little daughter until the whole process is over. After a few days, immigration inspectors came to my house. They were there to check whether we can really host two more people and whether we can take care of them. They also warned me in case Nancy tries flees that uh, I might be held responsible for that and maybe even criminally accused. The inspectors were in uniforms, so my daughter thought it was police. She ran over to my mother-in-law, which lives just in the neighboring house, and uh, told that the police was there. So my mother-in-law was the first person we had to tell the situation. Just a few days passed, and I received a message from Nancy. I am free. I am on the bus to Riga. Technically, she wasn't really free. She was, it was an alternative status of, of, 
of the tension, and I was partly held responsible for that. I picked them up at the bus station in Riga. They both were exhausted. Nancy looked very tired. She hadn't been eating or sleeping very well lately. Her little daughter, Rema, who just turned two a few days ago, was very calm and withdrawn. She was very quiet, afraid. It was impossible to get any emotions from her, even a smile. Rema has spent almost half of her life in detention centers and refugee centers, but she learns fast. Her favorite word in Latvian is tomats. She adores tomatoes. She calls my youngest son Bebe, and when I arrive home, she calls me Papa. But uh, I, I don't feel very comfortable with that. Yes, we have lost some privacy at home. Yes, we could have avoided this. But seeing Rema smile and happy is pure joy. She and my youngest son, Mix, are best friends now. They run around the house, they scream, they hug each other. Of course, they have difficulties sharing some things. They act just as any other children. It's been three weeks now since they're staying with us, but their story is still unfinished. Nobody knows what the future will bring for them. Am I naive? Yes, absolutely. I'm very naive. What if Nancy is not really telling the truth and her family actually doesn't have the danger? But even if there is the slightest chance of her story being true, I would never forgive myself if I wouldn't do everything possible to help her and her little daughter, of being possibly imprisoned. It's enough for me to understand what I would be capable of doing just to keep my family safe. I'm not here to preach or give a solution to this huge problem that Europe is facing now. We're all humans, and I strongly believe that humanitarian crisis that we're facing now can only be solved with humanity. This should have been the end of my speech, but uh, several days ago, just before leaving to work, we had a conversation with Nancy because we, we expressed our concern that uh, most of her time she was spending in her room. We were worried that she's getting more and more depressed because of the uncertainty, because of she doesn't know what the future will bring. The same day, Nancy and Rema didn't come home. They disappeared. How do I feel now? I feel sorry that I couldn't tell them everything is going to be okay. I hope they are safe. Thanks.